few weeks ago, we were all glued to our computers and our televisions and our phones during a football game. And it seemed before the night was over, the entire nation had tuned into that football game as a player lay on the field fighting for his life. Medics were able to save Damar Hamlin, and we've rejoiced and celebrated that in the past few weeks. That night in Cincinnati was notable for a number of reasons, one of which was the role of social media. You know, within minutes of play being stopped, the question then became, is this game going to resume? Or is it going to resume at another time? What's going to happen with the game? There's one stunning moment that stands out. As people are peering into what's going on, as we watch on our televisions, we begin to see a mass exodus. We begin to see a mass exodus from the stadium. And on the scoreboard, it said, this game has been suspended. Stay tuned, we'll, we'll provide further notification. But it was still in a state of suspension, yet all the people are leaving. What we realized was the game had been suspended, had been canceled for that evening. It hadn't been announced yet. People are leaving before they can even change the message on the screen. And before the stadium announcer can say anything, the seats are being empty. You see, people had phones with them in their seats. And social media is telling them that the NFL has decided to suspend the game for the evening. News travels fast. News travels fast. Fast. It traveled fast that night, you know, faster than the announcer or the announcement could be made. Sometimes it travels faster than people want it to. You know, companies spend billions of dollars making sure news is not announced ahead of time because of competition. But the speed of news can be a matter of life and death. You know, great news is meant to be shared. And that's the subject matter this morning. Good news to be shared. Now, we're in a very familiar story. Those of us that have grown up in church, if you've been around church very long, you know the story of Jesus' resurrection. We, and Margaret just read it. Easter Sunday. In fact, we're going to be back in this passage on Easter Sunday. So we're not covering everything today. We're just looking at one little piece of this in the story of Jesus' resurrection. We began 2023 talking about making conversation, bringing more of Jesus into more of our life, where we live, where we learn, where we work, where we play, bringing more of Jesus into more of our lives with more conversation. More conversation. So we're talking about conversation again this morning. Conversation about the big things in life. Now, we said a few weeks ago, we're going to remind you of a couple of points as we think about conversations and why we make conversation. The first thing is, those that we call the unchurched, or those who just don't go to church and haven't been to church, are more likely to come to church with a personal invite from somebody they know. That requires conversation. And then the de-churched, those who used to go to church, but they're not going to church anywhere anymore. They're not coming to church, but they're still very, very interested in a spiritual conversation. They still want to talk about Jesus. They just don't want to do it in church. Again, this is about conversation. Now, today's story is ground zero for those conversations. Now, that again. We don't have to talk about the resurrection every time we're having one of these spiritual conversations. You, you have 40,000 people in this community. You can have 40,000 different conversations about things of a spiritual nature and Jesus. But this is ground zero. This is where it all begins. This is where it all began. 
where it all starts. The story of the resurrection. So there's a few things that we're going to see this morning in Matthew. Again, we're going to look at this in a few weeks. But this morning, for our purposes of talking about conversation, things that we need to see in this story. And the first one is the obvious. In this story, there is the death, and there's an empty tomb. There's a death. A person named Jesus, the one who was promised in the Old Testament, the Messiah, comes, lives his life, Spends some time in ministry, and then he dies, and he's put in a tomb. Now, it's very, very easy for us to run to all of the good stuff in this story. This is a great chapter in our Bibles, and the biographies of Jesus, the biography we're reading is from Matthew. But here's what Matthew tells us at the very beginning. As the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. So just as the day's dawning, still dark, they're headed to a tomb. The Messiah who came to save his people from their sins has died for their sins. And it's still dark. It's dark as they make their way to that tomb. In fact, it's been dark, as far as they're concerned, for quite a while. You know, this story of the part of Jesus' life and his biography starts the night he was betrayed. We talk about that quite a bit here at the table. <laughs> and it all happens at night. Jesus is arrested at night. He's put on trial uh, as a kangaroo court, but he's put on trial at night. Last week we talked about his conversation with Pilate. That happens at night. When Jesus is crucified, it's during the day, but the whole sky goes dark. It's dark. And then he's in this tomb. And it's the break of dawn. And things are dark. But then it's not dark. And what's funny about this story is it's almost as if the darkness goes away immediately. Immediately, heaven itself is breaking in to the story. Heaven itself announces this. There's an angel that shows up and says, he's not here. Jesus is not here for he has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. There's no body. There's just an angel and an empty tomb. And things are very, very bright all of a sudden. Now, we read from, from the book of Daniel, Oscar read, the son of man figure whose, whose hair is on, it's like it's on fire, it's like lightning when this happens here at the tomb. Super bright, the night is gone, there is no body, there is no more death in the story. Death has been pushed out, been pushed aside, Something different is going on. And the tomb is empty. And he says, he is risen. You know, there's the fact of the resurrection. It, what's fascinating about the biographies that we have, nobody really describes Jesus walking out of the tomb. What we do have a description of are angels that show up and they're rolling the tomb away, uh, the, the stone away. There's an earthquake in this story as well, a violent, shaking earthquake. So there are some stunning things that are happening. There's a bunch of fear going on in this story. But there is no body. There is this fact that Jesus is risen. They can see this, the witnesses that are there. But then there's this announcement. It's not just the fact of the resurrection, but there's an announcement that goes along with it. And this announcement is a big deal. Here's what the angel says again. He's not here. He has risen. He has risen. That's a stupendous announcement. Some of the most amazing words that have ever been uttered. In fact, for early Christians, it became part of their greeting. He's not here. He's risen. He's risen indeed. 
Hallelujah. That's historic. He's risen. So he's risen. There's grace. There is love coming out of this grave in a person. And if they missed it the first time, the angel actually says it again. And this time he says, listen, I have told you. He says, he's not here. He is risen. Listen, I have told you. Pay attention. The word in some of the old English translations is behold. And when you hear that word behold, pay attention. Listen up. Somebody like grabbing you by the collar. Like if you're not listening now, listen now. I have told you. Told you what? He is risen. It's a huge event. It's not enough just to see. You have to hear the announcement that he has risen. So we have the death, we have the empty tomb, we have the announcement and an event and an announcement as big as this has to have witnesses. The witnesses. Even courts of law, what's, what's fascinating about this, even courts of law in that day, you had to have witnesses in order to establish a fact. We have that in our own court system. They have that in their court system. If you were trying to make a point, if you were trying to provide evidence, you had to have witnesses cooperate what's going on. And their courts just like our courts. What's different about this is that these witnesses aren't exactly the witnesses that you would have show up in the court in that day. <laughs> these witnesses are women. And women in those days, they could not be a witness in a legal trial. Their witness is considered not credible. Their testimony was considered less than. So you have an empty tomb. You have an announcement. And who gets to hear it first? Who gets to see it first? Those you wouldn't expect. Those you wouldn't expect. Jesus himself. In the very event, the greatest event to ever occur in human history, and the very first witnesses are those you would not expect. Those whom society had thrown aside. In fact, one of these ladies, not simply a lady, but she's notorious. Mary Magdalene, she'd been healed by Jesus of demon possession. She has a sordid past. And she's now a witness. Witness. They're not simply a, a witness, though, to the empty tomb. See, it's not just an angel who shows up and makes the announcement. As if to reinforce what they have just seen, on their way away from the tomb, Margaret read, here's what happens. Departing quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. They ran to tell his disciples the news. Just then, Jesus met them. Jesus met them and said greetings. Now, I chuckle. I, <laughs> I couldn't get over this as, as, as much as I saw this this week, the greetings. You know, <laughs> your, one of your best friends dies, is crucified. You show up at the tomb. He's not there. There's a grand announcement with an earthquake and an angel and an announcement. And then you see this best friend on your way away, and his first thing is greetings. I was like, what's up? <laughs> greetings. Like, that's the first thing he says. Greetings. What's going on? So the un unbelievable news now becomes great news. They see their best friend first firsthand. They're not simply witnesses to this empty tomb. They're witnesses to their friend now. Jesus. 
Jesus, the one who loves them, the one who has redeemed them, the one who has provided them love and grace, the one who brought them in and brought them close, even though most of the society for, for these ladies, they were outcasts. This is the Jesus that embraced them and loved them, and now their grief is joy. But Jesus is saying the same thing as the angel. That announcement, <laughs> that announcement becomes a commission. The commission. Jesus and the angel are saying the same thing. They have the same instructions. Here's what the angel says. The first thing the angel says when he says he's not here, he's risen. He says, go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead. And then Jesus shows up. And in their shock of seeing their best friend, this is what Jesus says. Jesus tells them, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. So both Jesus and the angel are telling the women this. Go and tell. Go and tell. If you tie, I did this this week. If you type in go and tell into Google, you'll start scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And you know what the number one subject is of go and tell in Google? It's this. It's Jesus. All sorts of Christian websites and Christian pages and all sorts of stuff. Go and tell. That's not a phrase that we use, apparently. In our culture and in our society, which is kind of it's kind of interesting, right? Because <laughs> we're bombarded with billions of dollars of advertising and marketing and advertising is a billion dollar industry, and so there are people that are going and telling all the time, right? But that phrase seems to be unique to this story. Go and tell. This good news. This announcement isn't to be kept to themselves, it's to be shared. It's not just for them. Jesus has disciples, they're someplace else. Go share with them. And a few weeks later, this is reinforced. The last conversation that Jesus is having with his best friends, in Matthew even, Jesus says this, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing and teaching them. Now, he says a bunch of other things here, but we need to focus on the go and make disciples of it. So, this good news, this big event, this stupendous event, this unbelievable event of an empty tomb of a risen Jesus, go and tell. Go and make disciples. Now, we can approach this story and we can go through the facts of Jesus showing up in a bodily resurrection. This really happened as, as just a bunch of facts. It can all be very, very academic. In fact, it kind of sounds academic. You have this angel, you've got this tomb, you've got this earthquake, you got a risen Jesus, and Jesus is meeting these ladies. But think about what is happening with these ladies and Jesus and with his best friends and Jesus in this moment. This isn't simply an academic exercise to go and tell and go make disciples. We could treat it that way. But Jesus has a relationship with these ladies. In fact, he's got a relationship with his best friends that he's talking about going and making disciples. He's got, he's, it's personal. He's our best friend. They have spent three years together, most of them. They know each other backwards and forwards. He knows the worst of them. And some of them, the night of his arrest and his death, didn't treat him very nicely. And yet here he is. They're racing away from this empty tomb. He shows up and he is saying, here I am. It's okay. Go and tell. 
and it was his, his best friends. A couple weeks later, same thing. It's all okay. This is love. This is grace that he is providing in the moment. And this love and this grace that he provides them, even though he knows the worst about them, even though they have treated him wrongly, he still provides grace. And he's saying, now go and tell. So when, you, when they talk about Jesus being risen, and by the way, you start reading another another piece of history here, this book of Acts that we have in our New Testament, you find out that these ladies and these friends, they turn the world upside down. And you know what's on their lips? You know what they're talking about the whole time? Again and again and again, Dr. Luke records for us in Acts. They're talking about the resurrection. They're talking about their best friend. The one who, we talked to a couple of weeks ago, the one who knows everything about me, who tells us everything we ever did and still loves us anyway. They turned, up, they turned the world upside down with that good news. That was good news for them. And it is good news for us. Love, grace, and compassion. You know, this message was motivation for them. They really did go and tell. They really did go and make disciples. They were what researchers call the eager, eager conversationalists. The eager conversationalists. Now, not all of us are that eager. But the reason why Matthew puts this in his biography of Jesus and writes it this way is so that we will be compelled, we will be enraptured, that, that this same story will motivate us in the same way, that we will feel compelled to go and tell, that we will feel compelled to go and make disciples, because we've received the same grace, we've received the same life, we've received the same forgiveness. Jesus is our friend. And so, as we think about making conversation, you know, some of us kind of have that knack, but all of us have it at some point been touched by grace. And I guarantee you this morning that I am standing in front of a place where Jesus every week is giving us grace and forgiveness. We've all been touched by this. We don't share the same eagerness. Some of us are a little more reluctant, and that's another category here. But I want you to see something here as far as the eager conversationalists. We've been talking these past few weeks about the fact that most people, and we've been using this bottom number here, non-Christians, non those who are not yet connected to Jesus, so 55% of them, they still like to have spiritual conversations. They're still glad to have these conversations. And we don't need to live in fear that, that we're going to be broaching a subject that nobody wants to talk about. Oh, with some, there is that, obviously. But still 55%. But these numbers up here, 73, 78, 78, 86, those are those, the, the, those of us who have been touched by Jesus. And those higher numbers... That's simply a reflection of people who've been touched by grace, touched by love, who have tasted and seen of the resurrection. It makes them eager. Now, these are all generational categories, millennials, Gen X, boomers. Eager conversations, 86%, just love talking about Jesus. But even then, those that are reluctant, 72%. That's the rest of us. And I'll tell you the truth, I tend to fall in that, that second category. But regardless of whether we're reluctant or eager, we all can say that, that resurrection has something to do with me and you. Me and you. It's all about sharing our experience of the resurrection with somebody else. It doesn't have to be difficult. 
Now, we talked about this last week. We have the opportunity here next week. Jesus is in the Super Bowl. And we're going to have more information again. I'll send the text again around this week. Jesus is in the Super Bowl. There's a group that has spent a lot of money. If you've seen the He Gets Us commercials, there's going to be two more in the Super Bowl. The whole purpose of these commercials and the two that are going to be in the Super Bowl it is simply conversation starters. They're not deep. They're not deep. It's talking about who Jesus is for us and how he gets us. And so, uh, uh, three things to keep in mind. By the way, this is the text, and again, I'll send this out a little later. We have the opportunity to do this. And you may be wondering, so how do we do this? This is all about having a conversation over a commercial. When was the last time you had a conversation over a commercial? Sometime this week, right? We do it all the time. Right? <laughs> and it's usually, hey, did you see that truck that I really want? <laughs> you see that Toyota that Troy, Troy, has, Troy has in his lot? I saw a commercial for that truck. <laughs> yeah. We're always talking about the advertising, right? Go places. That's the, that's the Toyota thing. Let's go places. So we're always talking about commercials. This is simply an opportunity for all of us to talk about Jesus. Simply as a conversation starter. So be discerning, obviously. Uh, be discerning of who you're with, who you're around, and be listening for that opportunity. Be curious. I'd say of all these things, be, be discerning, be curious, and stay connected. Be curious is probably the most important thing. In fact, if you think about it, again, I said last week, it doesn't take a theologian, it doesn't take a pastor to have these conversations. Just curiosity. What do you think? What do you think of the commercial? Well, that'll, that'll open up some conversation. Where are you at in all this? And ask questions about the life. Curiosity drives a lot of great conversation about Jesus. Because curiosity makes the other person more important than me and what's going on. If I'm curious, I'm not talking about myself. If I'm curious, I want to know what's going on with Jacob. What is going on with Jacob? <laughs> no, curiosity. Curiosity will carry that conversation. Go and tell. We go and tell the good news of what we've seen and what we experienced. This isn't just for us, but it's for the next guy. It's for others. And those people are all around us. This is us bringing more Jesus into more of life in more conversations. Where we live, where we learn, where we work and where we play. And it all begins with that empty tomb and a risen Jesus on resurrection morning. Let's pray.